Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. My name is Mike Williams. Mm -hmm. I am the Education Projects Manager for the NHC. Today's session is entitled Understanding the Modern Middle East. Our leader for this session is Akram Kader, Professor of History at North Carolina State University. You know, as I begin, I want to give a special shout out and thanks to my colleagues in the Education Department who are Andy Mink, our Vice President for Education Programs, who leads the center's efforts to strengthen humanities teaching at both the collegiate and pre-collegiate levels. Through his visionary leadership, we've expanded our webinars, interactive classroom sessions, and extensive digital archives of primary source materials. Libby Taylor, who is our Education Programs Coordinator, Libby, who is also with us tonight, is our primary contact between the scholars and the webinars. She works with our scholars to prepare their PowerPoints, collect their readings, and share them with you. We are appreciative of the work that she's doing behind the scenes for this series and the education programs as a whole. And again, my name is Mike Williams. I'm Education Project Manager, and my role is to help manage the Education Department's digital materials, our online course offerings, as well as other on-site and off-site programming that we have at the NHC. The National Humanities Center is located in Durham, and for 42 years, we've supported the best in humanities scholarship and humanities education. We are the only nonprofit institution devoted exclusively to the study of the humanities. Here at the center, our education program serves as a nexus between our scholars and educators. Our goal is to build the bridges between the scholarly world and the everyday classroom. We support educators at all levels with the large majority being at the K through 12 level, but we do have collegiate and graduate level educators as well. We would like to encourage you all to visit our new web site. It has under, undergone a makeover in the past 12 months and that makeover gives you all access to all the content in the center and to ensure that all the da databases are searchable and indexable. Um, in the program section, you can access all of our current educational init initiatives. So if you'll note on the screen, we have searchable indexes for our content material that we have, as well as our past webinars. Um, for example, our March 31st, uh, webinar, American Indians and the American Cultural Imagination is available if you go onto the website and search. In addition, coronavirus and context epidemics and history is also available. A couple of announcements about our programming here at the NHC. So our Teacher Advisory Council, some of you may be familiar with it, but all of the work that I'm describing is informed by a strong and talented Teacher Advisory Council. We have a team of educators across the country who are giving us feedback and consult with us on various projects. We're currently accepting application for next year's council. I would encourage you to apply if you're interested in being more actively involved in the center and benefit from the work that we're doing. We encourage you to apply by May 22nd. 22nd. The instructions are available on our website. Online courses. Online courses are accepting registrations as well. These are five or six module courses that will allow you to dig more deeply into different topics and engage with the work that we're doing at the center. I would also like to announce, and many of you may already know, that we are in fact an approved PD provider uh, for LAUSD with 20, 35 hours of PD credit that translates into one salary point. So if you have interest or a cohort or a group, we would also work with you on group rates on that. I'd also like to announce that from now until May 6th, we have early bird registration discounts. Uh, using the code EDU, EDU1920, EDU1920 for 20% off of the early registration fees for our courses that we are running during our summer session. In addition, for upcoming events, we are accepting two additional registrations for beyond February. So right now we're at capacity, but we have two positions, uh, two spots that are open. Um, so. As you all are aware, state curriculums are being redesigned to incorporate more key themes in the African-American experience. So again, we have a limited space, but if you are in fact interested, please check out the nationalhumanitiescenter.org website. Just a few reminders. From the operational side, I ask that you mute your microphones and I may have already muted everyone um, and you will participate using only the chat box. And a few of our, our webinars, We've had participants who've had audio issues. And so if you're having audio issues and you're unable to hear my voice, then it tends to be on the user end. I can generally be remedied by a few steps 
maybe your volume is down, check your audio headphone connections. Um, there's also a settings icon to confirm that you're connected to the computer. And if, in fact, none of this works, you may want to just um, power off and uh, re-enter the session. My role as the moderator is to receive your questions and bring your thoughts into the conversation with Dr. Cater. So if I overlook your question, please feel free to type it in a second or a third time. And, you know, in breaks during the presentation, I'll work to ensure that I bring those to his attention. Documenting your participation, at the end of tonight's session, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation of the webinar. And once you complete it, you can download your certificate to be added to your portfolio and submit it to your local certifying authority. Um, it generally takes about an hour to get those out. So, um, you know, um, just wait and you'll receive them. If you run into any difficulties, um, please feel free to email us, okay? Um, let's get started. So, Dr. Akram Kader. Uh, Dr. Akram Kader is a university faculty scholar, professor of history, and holds the Kahala Chair in Diaspora Stories, Studies at North Carolina State University, where he also serves as the director of the Kahala Center for Lebanese Diaspora Studies. Dr. Kader is a native of Lebanon and graduate of California Polytechnic State University. He holds an MA and PhD degrees in history from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and University of California, Berkeley, respectively. His books include Inventing Home, Immigration, Gender, and the Making of a Lebanese class, Middle Class, 1861 to 1921, and The History of the Middle East, a source book of the history of the Middle East and North Africa, and Embracing the Divine, Passion and Politics in the Christian Middle East. He's completed a PBS documentary on the history of the Lebanese community in North Carolina and served as senior curator for a muse museum exhibit on the same topic. He's also curated the traveling exhibit, The Lebanese in America, which toured six U.S. cities through 2019. He has published a substantial number of articles and reviews and has made, has made conference presentations throughout the United States and internationally. He's delivered in excess of 300 talks in the past 10 plus years on topics related to the Middle East. He's been awarded a number of teaching accolades, including outstanding teacher, outstanding junior faculty, and outstanding extension faculty and grants during his tenure at NC State, and has also obtained fellowships from the National Humanities Center, American Philosophical Society, National Endowment for the Humanities, Fulbright Foundation, Council of American Overseas Research Centers, among others. His professional affiliations include Middle East Studies Association, Arab American Studies Association Academy, American Academy of Religion, the American Historical Association. He is also editor of the International Journal of Middle East Studies and sits on the editorial board of a book series on immigration studies. And so at this time, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to unmute you. So everyone, if you be patient with me as I go down our list and ensure that he is on here and we will get started here shortly. As I'm doing this, I'm going through the names and they're all populating. I see a few names from course participants. Dr. Cater, are you there? I am indeed here. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for your patience. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer the mouse on over to you. So if you want to test that, um, again, thank you for joining us and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from you this evening. Thank you again. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Libby, so much for all the work that you guys have done. Uh, behind the scenes and for the introduction and welcome everyone uh, i'm sorry we cannot see each other in uh, real life but i think uh, in the current uh, course of the pandemic we're all getting very much used to the virtual life of ours for better or for worse uh, so we're going to spend a bit of time together talking about the middle east uh, as mike said i'm a historian um, and i specialize in the history of the modern middle east my hope for this session is primarily to refocus how we understand the region uh, from a cultural religious perspective to a more historical perspective. And I'll address what I mean by that as we go through the process. Um, what we will do is we will start out by talking about how we have approached the Middle East, how most people understand the Middle East, uh, if at all. Uh, and then what I'd like to do is do a quick tour, Reader's Digest, if you will, of the 20th century of the Middle East. Uh, and I apologize, it's gonna be a bit of a racing through it, but it allows us to see basically the historical trends and understand the role of history in shaping this region that is absolutely 
vital to the world and obviously very much part of American foreign and even domestic policies. Uh, be, before I uh, proceed with this, what I would like to also say is I'd like to try to keep this to about 45 minutes on my part, give or take a few, and to allow for more questions and answers. So uh, without much further ado, let's go ahead and start. So generally speaking, I'm going to see, there you go. Uh, the Middle East has really primarily been understood from what we call an Orientalist perspective. Uh, that is, it has been seen as this alien place that is locked in uh, time. And generally speaking, most people uh, who think of the Middle East think of it as, quote unquote, an ancient place, a traditional place, an old place, a place where things have been playing out the same way for thousands of years, whether it is, well, a Palestinian Israeli conflict, whether it's about religion. So again, it's an environment that sits outside of history, if you will, and it's considered to be almost frozen. So that's the first way. The second way we see it is that it's the, in direct contradiction to the West. Uh, and in many ways, as one of the most important scholars in Middle East and other kind of studies, Edward Said wrote in his book, Orientalism, uh, in many ways, the West has come to define itself as the opposite of the Middle East. If the uh, West is rational, the Middle East is irrational. If the West is democratic, the Middle East is undemocratic. If the West uh, provides more rights for people and women, the Middle East doesn't. If the West is peaceful, the Middle East is violent, so on and so forth. And these ideas are not simply ideas of politicians or intellectuals, although indeed they were, but also they have infiltrated in many ways become part of the cultural baggage. And I think that's very important because none of us, and especially your students, are coming to study the Middle East without that cultural baggage. Whether we're talking about the 18th century and the pirates of Tripoli, uh, in which we have the first uh, United States military encounter, naval encounter, uh, across the sea from Libya in which uh, Jefferson dispatched the Navy there to Pulp Fiction of the 1950s to, of course, contemporary times. Uh, and generally speaking, the theme is always the same. The theme is about a group of people who are absolutely violent. They're irrational. And of course, you know, the only way we differentiate these brown people from other brown people is they happen to be wearing kafiyas or, uh, if you will, they're carrying you know, these curved knives. They are people that you cannot trust. They are people that are irrational. And if you had a chance to watch Planet of the Arabs, you see how Hollywood portrays this particular ethnic community, Arabs in general. And uh, if you see the long spread of films coming out of Hollywood, and I'm just using that as an example, from the silent era almost all the way to yesterday, what you will find is that all Arab characters tend to share the same things. They tend to be irrational, violent, loud, uh, threatening. They are not people that we actually can sit and have a rational conversation with. Compounding this approach to the Middle East is that the United States throughout most of the 20th century, but particularly in the second half of the 20th century and continuing on today, has had a two-pronged approach to the region. One is that we have seen it primarily as a source of oil, as one Chapel Hill, uh, that is Chapel Hill in North Carolina, a comedian once said, what I would really like to know is how is it that our oil got under their sand? So oil was the primary point of interaction. And that is in many ways what has driven United States foreign policy towards regimes that are absolutely undemocratic and even quite in many ways medieval, such as Saudi Arabia, where we actually support them because they are essential for the production and distribution of oil, which in turn is very much essential to world economy. The second prong of approach is Israel. The United States has been solidly and almost completely uh, the major supporter of the creation and the continuation of the state of Israel. And this, it's irrelevant really about your own personal politics as we're talking. It's irrelevant whether you think that's a good idea or a bad idea. The point is that our approach to the region has basically been wholeheartedly supportive of Israel. And as such, it has created a skewed notion of the region. So if you couple the cultural uh, take we have on it with this kind of policy approach, what we have seen the region is, is to be filled with a place that provides us with resources, but really a place that does not have a whole lot of uh, human interest to us in some ways. And as we will see as we go forward, 
this has translated into particular kind of policies that are very much militarily driven. In other words, and we will see this again, as I said, uh, if we do come to believe at the level of the general population and at the level of the policymakers, that the region is filled with people that are at best alien to us, but at more frequently, uh, they are hostile to us. Therefore, our approach to the region is tends to be very much premised on the basis of using military uh, encounters and military strategies to deal with the region rather than any kind of rational diplomatic approaches for long term. Now, uh, what I would like to argue is that this notion, this idea that is inculcated all the way from the level of policymakers to your students in the classroom, that the region is this alien out of place, uh, out of time place that is filled with violent and quite frankly anti-American people is really not the best way to understand it. In other words, and I'm going to illustrate this with a one clear example. Uh, for after 9-11, of course, the, tr the the horrendous terrorist attack that we encountered, a lot of people were trying to understand why that happened. For a while, we began to try to understand cause and effect, or as we know it, history. However, very quickly, the the narrative shifted to a cultural narrative, a religious narrative. And that was, it's because they were Muslim. So in other words, we no longer talked about history, about cause and effect, about change over time, but rather what we talked about is that this is a group of people that are embedded in a religious ideology called Islam, and that is an antithetical uh, you know, ideology to the United States, and that it explains everything that we have. Of course, that is an incredibly incorrect and facile argument, because if that was the case, then one would have to say that instead of the you know, dozens of terrorists that we encountered in 9-11 flying planes, we should have about 1.5 billion terrorists because if, if all Muslims or if Islam drives people to terrorism, then all 1.5 billion Muslims should be terrorists. The point I'm trying to make here is that we have to go back and understand the region historically. And what I'd like to do here is I would like to uh, focus primarily on, around the turn of the century. And with that, I would like to start out with this notion of what was before. We're not going to have a whole lot of time to discuss it, but as most of you know, in general, the region we understand to be the modern Middle East, and what I'm using this term, I'm referring to, and you can, people have applied this term to a variety of things, but I, today I'm using it to include Egypt, Turkey, Iran, and the heartland of the Arab world, which is Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, and the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, some other people would include North Africa, others would go as far as Pakistan. However, most Middle East scholars agree that what we understand to be the Middle East stretches from Iran in the east to Egypt in the west, from Turkey in the north, all the way to Saudi Arabia and Yemen in the south. Now, as you know, that this area that we uh, understand to be the Middle East was predominantly governed until World War I by the Ottoman Empire which was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural empire. That changes in, in World War I. And in essence, what World War I does is it allows the French and the British to accomplish what they had been wanting to do throughout most of the 19th century, the 1800s, and that is to basically dissect, take apart the Ottoman Empire and make it into colonial outposts. And that is indeed what happens between World War I and World War II. The British and the French gain absolute control over this region. Some of it is direct, such as in Iraq and in Syria and Lebanon, where the French uh, and the British have troops and administrators governing the area, or it could be indirect, as in the case of the Persian Gulf. Either way, direct or indirect colonial rule was meant to perpetuate the interests of the French and the British. And even the very division and the creation of these modern nation states itself was meant for the interests of the French and the British. For example, the French were very much interested in having naval bases along the Eastern Mediterranean, which is why they wanted uh, the Eastern Mediterranean coasts of Lebanon and Syria. The English, on the other hand, were very much in, uh, interested in the Persian Gulf because of its connection to India, and of course, because oil had become a very important, uh, was becoming very important, and the British Navy had shifted from coal to oil, and so they really exercised direct control over Iraq and indirect control, if you will, over the rest of the Persian Gulf. So the creation of this, what we know today as the modern Middle East, was not really something that was done organically from within by the people living there. Uh, nobody really was consulted in the process in drawing the maps and what have you, but rather it was to fit 
British and French imperial and colonial interests. Furthermore, uh, between World War I and World War II, the French and the British gained this control specifically uh, to, under something called the Mandate. And what the Mandate does is that it allowed the French and the British to control these new made nation states as long as they cannot govern themselves, which means that the French and the British had every incentive to not allow for self-governance. And this becomes a very critical element in the history of the modern Middle East, because in essence, even though the French and the British argue that they're there to help the local inhabitants become more democratic, or as the French called it, civilized, la mission civilisatrice, rather what they ended up doing was undermining every mechanism of self-governance, whether it is elections, whether it is free press, whether it is, uh, if you will, expression uh, of national identity in terms of education otherwise. So the very mechanisms that we use in the United States and most democratic societies use to negotiate differences, to allow, because quite frankly, every nation has its own stresses, as you all very well know. The question is, are there peaceful mechanisms to negotiate that stresses? Uh, for instance, in the United States, every four years, we have a civil war. We call it the presidential elections. And I am sure you recognize how violent the vitriol and the rhetoric gets to be, especially in the last few years. Well, we do that. We don't come to blows, hopefully, anyway. But we do it through elections, through the free press, and through the court system. The problem in the Middle East is not that the nations are artificial or they're somehow they do not understand democracy. In fact, poll after poll indicates that there's a direct, almost one-to-one -one correlation between uh, values held in the United States amongst Americans vis-a-vis uh, -vis democracy and the values held vis-a-vis -vis democracy and you know self-rule in the Middle East. There's not a whole lot of difference in that sense. What is different is that the mechanisms had been corrupted during the colonial period, they had been undermined, and as such, these modern nation states were born very much crippled. They were not allowed the mechanisms that would, uh, you know, would allow the inhabitants within Syria, the inhabitants within Iraq, the inhabitants within uh, Lebanon, these newfound nations to negotiate their differences. So this was an incredible amount of stress. As you can imagine, just from the American Civil War, even almost 100 years after we declared independence, we have a civil war because nations are very problematic. They bring people together that are not always going to get along and, in fact, quite often don't want to be together. But they are held together by this kind of nation structure. And the way they negotiate it, as I said, is through democratic mechanisms, such as the court system, elections, and the free press. With that really being severely curtailed and in some places completely not allowed to happen, by the end of World War II, when the French and the British are now exiting the scene because of independence movements, these modern nation states are left with very little mechanisms to allow them to govern effectively amongst them. And uh, I, I don't want to spend too So in essence, we leave the 1940s and get into the 1950s, and that's when we see a lot of independence movements within the region. But what happens is that the democratic experiment in this is in some ways a stillbirth because again the mechanisms were not allowed to flourish under colonialism but rather the only thing that is allowed to flourish under that uh, period and the only lesson of political rule is that if if you have control of power you should govern because that is exactly how the french and the british governed despite the rhetoric of civilization democracy the only reason they could stay there between 1920s and all the way to the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in some cases, is because they had an army and they could deploy the army to suppress revolts. Well, that lesson was not lost on some of the leadership within region. And very quickly, what we find happening within Iraq, within Egypt, within Syria, is that the military becomes very quickly involved in the political process, not as a sort of a temporary thing, but ultimately they become permanent rulers of the population. So although the language is maintained of a constitutionally driven republic in a lot of these areas, the reality is there is no democracy that is kept there. It's just nothing but a shell of itself. The judiciary is not independent, the press is controlled by the government, and uh, the military and the police are deployed in the interest of the state. So in many ways, this is a carryover from the French and the British. One of the, some of the things do change, but things that do not change is that those mechanisms of ruling over a people without really a public, uh, without a really popular referendum remain in place and in fact are accentuated. 
And as we will see, what really allows that to happen is oil, because oil allows states to be independent from tax revenue. And that independence gives them a lot of leeway to do what they want without necessarily public support or public consultation. Uh, so, for example, here in the United States, uh, tax revenue, what you know, and the idea is uh, no taxation, uh, you know, without representation, that formula that provides the state with money based on the revenue from taxpayers, oil completely pushes it aside, certainly in the 60s, 70s and, and other places. Now, of course, there are exceptions. So I don't want to oversimplify, but it's important to understand that the model that the French and the British put in place in the 1920s through the 40s is adopted and expanded into authoritarian regimes that are led by local Arab leaders in many ways. Israel becomes its own special category because Israel in many ways becomes not so much a democracy, but an ethnocracy. ethnocracy. And we can talk about that more. The idea here is that it becomes a Jewish state in which Arab citizens are either who are living within the boundaries of Israel are not given full rights, or those who are living outside the boundaries of uh, Israel are under occupation. But again, that's a particular case that we can talk about later. So what happens with a lot of these regimes in the 60s and 70s and thereafter is that they begin to exercise increasingly political repression. Uh, and they are doing that because they, they are capable of doing that. What I mean by that is they have monopoly over the means of violence. And they have monopoly over revenue, as I alluded to, especially in a place like Iraq, which became super wealthy, and Iran as well, by the way, be, under the Shah in the 60s and 70s because of oil revenue. They can exercise a single party, single leader rule, and they can use political repression, torture, exile, murder, uh, and imprisonment to frighten their own populations. This political repression also succeeds, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, because the state exercises near monopoly over media. There is the official radio station, the official television station, and the semi-official and official newspapers. And so in many ways, the state is capable of controlling the narrative to a large degree. It doesn't mean that everybody accepted the narrative, but it certainly is really exercises an oversized role uh, in, in controlling the narrative. So, and it's that ability of oil revenue that allows it to do so. So for example, in Iraq, we find somebody like Saddam Hussein, who is absolutely a brutal dictator, who is capable of buying out those, the opponents when he is not exiling and imprisoning them or killing them. And this co-optation, this idea of buying the silence becomes something of a function of what we call the rentier state, the rent state. And what that term means is that regimes like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and even Egypt are, in essence, dealing with citizenry not as individuals with individual rights, but as a corporate body. And that corporate body gives the state its, its allegiance, and in return, the state gives its services. So the Saudi regime gives its people a comfortable lifestyle. In return, the people in Saudi Arabia do not necessarily demand elections. In Iraq, we see the same thing. If you belong to the state-funded and authorized engineers union, you get a lot of privileges, a club where you can go swimming with your kids, a middle-class life that is quite good, an education, as long as you provide allegiance to the state and no opposition. So for those who actually continue to exercise opposition, political repression becomes uh, the answer. Uh, because we're I'm talking to educators, I thought this would be very important as well. What is really interesting in many ways is that early on we find in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, massive movement on the part of these new states in the region to develop, uh, to expand education dramatically. And in many ways they succeed. But for them, education is not about uh, necessarily opening minds and allowing for critical analysis and allowing the uh, students to grow into full individual human beings, but rather it's about controlling these uh, students and how they understand the world uh, in many ways. And so these, these classrooms and these, uh, the teachers in them become in some ways what Pink Floyd, the wall, sings against, the idea that this is mind control, that this is an attempt uh, to control the narrative, uh, you know, for example, at one point, Saddam Hussein gave a speech to teachers, uh, the teachers union in Iraq, and he basically told them that it is very important to simplify history because children's minds cannot deal with complexity. So that rather than talk about ethnic minorities in Iraq, they should only emphasize that all Iraqis are Arab, never mind 
that there's a significant Kurdish non-Arab ethnic minority there. Uh, and so as you can see that education becomes very important. But the problem is, uh, as we enter the 80s, 90s, not only are we talking about school, uh, public schools as in some ways propaganda machines, it doesn't mean they're not educating people in other ways, but they're still politically trying to repress uh, you know, free expression. But what is also happening is slowly but surely, and I'm sure this is going to sound familiar, is we are going to enter into educational crises. And the problem that this happens is because there's a population explosion in the Middle East in the second half of the 20th century. Demographically, today, for example, uh, those between the age of zero and 25 make up 60, and on average, 60% of the population in most countries in the Middle East and North Africa. It's a very young population. So in addition to the corruption and the ineptitude of the state, we also have the reality that the Middle East is growing demographically big. And that leads to some serious issues, underpaid teachers, underfunded schools, and overcrowded classrooms. On this chart alone, I think you can see the difference between how much money the United States puts into per, per student, and these are average numbers, obviously every state has a different number, and how Egypt, Syria, and Tunisia are how much investment they are putting into the students uh, and this is you know just to make you perhaps feel a little bit better about salaries in the k-12 through in the united states uh look at the numbers a teacher in egypt was making about 50 dollars a month and this these figures are from the early 2000 uh before that it was a little less now the problem that what compounds all of this at this time is that uh at the same time that we're seeing crisis the demographic boom that I was talking about is also leading to heavy unemployment. And these numbers that you see on the chart are in many ways not real. What I mean by that is these are official numbers and they do not count the underemployed, nor do they really count uh, the full level of unemployment. But even here, you can see the crisis level. 20% in Egypt for men, nearly 40% for women. If you look at Algeria, similar number. Iran, large numbers, Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. These are huge numbers of unemployed people, young people. And the problem with these figures uh, is that, so in addition to political repression, what you're finding is this young generation, this generation that's coming of age in the 90s and 2000, is finding its future completely uh, curtailed, stopped, because without a job, they cannot uh, start a family. They cannot start a life. And so what we end up having across the 20th century is that slowly but surely, uh, the regimes are increasing their repression, they're mismanaging the economies uh, of their population, and we end up with a population, a young population, that in Algeria they call the Haitist, which is a com compounding of the term height, which means a wall in Arabic, and east, which is a French suffix, or basically the people who stand on the wall, or the unemployed who wear Ramoni's t-shirts. And this is all happening now by the end of the 1990s, early 2000s. We begin to see then that a century of poverty and social malaise is beginning to emerge within many of the countries. A young population that is existing in a politically repressive environment, in an economically problematic uh, place with very little hope for jobs to go forward. So to recap, I want to stop here for a second because I've taken us over a really fast term. So what I'm trying to get at, get at here is that uh, the the is that the to understand why we end up where we are in the region, and I'm going to end up with the Arab Spring, by the way. But why we end up there in a in a region that is filled with a lot of tensions is because on one hand you see this colonial history that undermines the organic growth of any self-governance that can diffuse uh, not only tensions, but also allow for an economic development that is beneficial to a large majority of the population and allows for social justice. That by the uh, half of the 20th century, by the 1950s and even as late as the 1960s, is being replaced by local rulers who are emulating the colonial model, but simply expanding it and making it even more repressive because they have more access to revenue from oil in some cases, and they have access to the only means of violence, the military and the police. 
and this what i'm arguing here is this, this generates a lot of stress internally in which you have a population that is chafing under the suppression authoritarianism and we will see that various attempts to try to get beyond that but the point is uh i don't need to to me to to describe an environment in which nothing good is happening there are some good things happening uh, of course an expansion in education at least for a while was good uh, there's a lot of creativity at the cultural uh, level that is in itself very good and i think what is also remarkable is that the population even under these conditions continues to work hard to raise families and uh, to be creative so there it's not that this was completely you know uh, negative but rather that it became a more repressive environment that was depriving a good number of the population i would argue the majority of the population from the opportunity to full, live fully to their potential and as this younger generation begins to complain in the 90s and thereafter uh, the state's response to the fact that there is no institutions to help them you know i'm talking here about you know better schools because schools are getting overcrowded i'm talking about better employment training because they don't have that anymore even garbage collection in some poor neighborhoods is completely stopped clean water is not being supplied health clinics are not there uh, this very basic infrastructure that is missing from these people's life including social services and green spaces as they react to this as they object to this as they protest and protests didn't start with the arab springs protests in the middle east were happening all the way through the second half of the 20th century it's just we weren't paying as much attention to them and again we can with questions and answers i can talk a little bit more about the form of protests because people weren't only demonstrating in you know thousands sometimes it was individual uh protests quiet protests but still protests in response to that the state begins to imagine the youth as dysfunctional so it's not that they have any uh valid argument that they're being politically repressed that they're being denied economic opportunities that they're being denied services but rather it is because they're doing drugs uh that they're immoral and that in some cases uh they are following satanic cults and there are some very famous case studies you know i mean cases in which the government has show trials of some uh heavy metal bands that are in north africa and the middle east and they put them on trial because they are considered to be the root of the problem so in addition to this so i have been talking so far about what's going on internally but also i think it's important to understand that the region wasn't simply being left to its own devices beginning with the french uh, with the, the french and the british mandate after world war one and throughout the 20th century and well into now the middle east has been at the heart of uh intervention from outside i mean if i was to list the number of interventions just by the united states it would be absolutely astounding how often we have sent troops there beginning of course with world war ii but after world war ii in the 1950s and the 1960s and 1970s 80s 90s and so on the united states was directly or indirectly involved in conflicts there whether it's through the cia and other intelligence agencies or whether through dispatching our own military again this is not an issue of whether you agree or disagree with sending military uh, to the region we can discuss that later but the point i'm trying to make is that the region wasn't only dealing with internal tensions the absence of any real mechanisms to negotiate them and the presence of repressive leadership and political parties but at the same time it was dealing with a great deal of external pressures and primarily as you can see from this time magazine cover oil is the main attraction oil becomes becomes so vital for the world economy that the united states and other countries such as the soviet union and france and britain cannot allow the region uh, to exist on its own rather they become very heavily involved in it as and as you will notice in this time cover magazine there are two major resources one is the suez canal on the left and one is the oil on the right and the picture that you see on the time cover is muhammad mossadegh who is the popularly democratically elected prime minister of iran in 19 early 1950s and this is one case in which the united states worried that he was too cozy with uh he was too much of a nationalist and for us any person who was so nationalist was too close to being a communist and the the fact that iran had oil the fact that iran was very close to the soviet union 
is what drove us ultimately to overthrow him through a CIA plot with the Iranian military. It's one of those cases where indeed there was a CIA plot to overthrow him, and indeed there was money paid out for his overthrow. Now, most American kids will never learn about this, but I can guarantee you that most kids in the Middle East learn about this. And I'm using this as an example, not to say we, the United States is bad, the United States is good. I, I, it's beyond that facile notion. I'm trying to argue that the narrative in the region is that the instability that we see there is as much about internal dynamics as it is about external interventions. And I'll give you another example of that. Uh, the place where I was born and raised is Lebanon. Uh, and there we sent the Marines. Unfortunately, there was a tragic attack on the Marine barracks uh, that killed hundreds of Marines. But at the same time, the United States was heavily involved in the conflict and the civil war there. And we sent the Marines there. We, of course, had sent them uh, there earlier in 1954, but this was uh, in the 1980s. And of course, as you very well know, I don't need to tell you this, but we have been, oops, sorry, we have been very heavily involved in Iraq uh, beginning in early 1993, all the way through. So again, what I'm trying to argue here, and I'm just using the United States as an example because the Soviet Union was involved, Britain and France were involved in various places, uh, that the region wasn't only trying to deal uh, with its own internal tensions and dysfunctionalities, but it also was constantly being disrupted by uh, external attacks. And I'm rushing through this, but I wanna stop for a second because I think it's important to keep this in mind. Uh, a lot of times, when we look at, for example, the American invasion of Iraq, and we see images in which the United States is deploying its mighty air force uh, and dropping these amazingly powerful uh, bombs, whether it's CNN or Al Jazeera or whatever you're watching, uh, and you see the big hole in the ground that is left, this crater that is left by an explosion, the camera moves away. But I really want you to think for a little bit. And I think this is an important exercise because you have to understand that this crater, although it's physical, it's also shredding social structures. It's shredding political structures. Uh, it's not simply that it's creating a big physical hole or that somebody is killed or injured but lives and trust and uh, feeling of safety and businesses and a notion of normalcy and routines, all of that is disrupted and shredded. And imagine if you will, you know, for those of us who live in North Carolina, when a hurricane comes through, with all the resources we have, how long it takes us to rebuild, especially after a devastating hurricane. Now think in terms of the Middle East and the violence that is visited from within and from without and the difficulty that people have in rebuilding. So what is actually remarkable to me about the region isn't uh, you know, that somehow it is falling behind uh, the, the, the tigers of Asia or that it's not you know, doing this or that, but rather that with all these kind of external pressures and internal dysfunctionality, that there's still this incredible dynamic among people there for creativity. And I'll give you one quick example. Uh, in Syria during the civil war that is continuing today, you know, the regime bombed the heck out of the city of Aleppo, including this one building that was about 12 stories. And it was, it looked like somebody took uh, a really, you know, dull knife and then cut half of it out. So an artist, what he does is he creates a Statue of Liberty from this building. And this is what I'm trying to get at, is that uh, this, this notion that in the region that people are always struggling to rebuild. And I think that's what's so admirable about it in many ways. And the other thing that is important to, uh, to understand is that we see, tend to see the region as tribal and ethnic as religious, right? Arabs and Jews, Muslims and uh, Sunnis and Shia. And these kind of identities, we tend to see them again as frozen in time, not as historical identities. And second, we tend to see them as uh, singular identities. That is a person is only a Sunni Muslim or Shia Muslim. The person is not a writer. The person is not a mother. The person is not, uh, you know, somebody who drives her kids to school and then she goes home and she writes this amazing poetry. No, she's a Shia Muslim. And we assume that people are fighting each other, uh, that, that the violence that we see coursing through the region is driven by this eternal age-old animosity. Well, the reality is actually it's the other way around. These animosities are driven by violence. It's the violence that shreds the normalcy that I'm talking about and leads people into a fearful state of being that forces them to retreat into these kind of boundaries that are either ethnic or religious, if you will. So it's not that their divisions 
are what drives them to violence is that the violence is what's driving them to these divisions. Uh, and I'll give you a very quick example. I grew up in the Civil War in Lebanon, and you know my neighborhood was incredibly mixed, socioeconomically as well as religiously. And quite honestly, my relationship to my friends was based not on a religious or class criteria. It was based on whether this person could play soccer well or not play soccer well. That was how I divided the world. Uh, the Civil War takes place, and then what we now term ethnic cleansing begins to happen. These militias are exercising violence against people of a different religion. And there was a gruesome event that happens in my neighborhood that within six weeks, my neighborhood becomes mono-religious. Only people left there are Christians. All my Muslim friends, all my Druze friends have left because of fear. So in many ways, that's what drives the violence that the region has experienced is what drives it. Now, these two tensions that I'm talking about, the internal dysfunctionality and the external interventions and pressures uh, lead people to, to sort of try to understand how do we resolve this. Some follow neoliberalism, the idea of living a consumer-driven life. The idea is, look, you know, this world sucks, let's go party. Let's go buy things. You know, let's go pretend that there is a snow village in a mall in Dubai, even though the temperature outside is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and, you know, we actually took our students to see this edifice that you're looking at right now. So for some who could afford it, they escape the harsh realities of the region by traveling, by buying, by having nice cars. But of course, that is very much curtailed to those who have the means to do so. And that's primarily in terms of countries, the oil-rich countries of the Gulf, such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi, and the elites of the non-oil-rich countries like Syria, Iraq, uh, I mean, Syria, and to some extent, yeah, Iraq, Egypt, and Tunisia. Uh, so I think this, this whole notion that I'm, I'm trying to get at here is that neoliberalism is an outlet. It's a way uh, in which you can exist in this in bubble, but and here, truly, it is a bubble, as you're looking at this picture. It's almost like a snow globe, which would look like in real life. Uh, that can only be attained if you have a lot of money, and it, it also has a feeling of emptiness. Again, a small anecdote. We used to take students to Egypt every summer, and we would spend about six weeks there. They lived in a fairly modest neighborhood, and they worked in a very poor neighborhood, as well as took courses in, in uh, history and language. But we also took them for three days to Dubai, and the reaction they had the first day they arrived there is, of course, they are like kids in a candy store. It's wonderful, hot showers. We were guests of the uh, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. We put us, they put us up in five-star hotels. But by day three, they were tired of it. There was a sense of ennui because it was empty, because it was consumer-driven rather than any deep culture. The other response to all of these things, the political repression and internal dysfunctionality and external intervention, is that it creates spaces, especially in failed states, for the rise of these violent visionaries. These people who are using religion, in some cases, as an ideology to create a vision, a vision of empowerment in the face of loss of power, uh, a vision where there, was, there are no more visions. I mean, neoliberalism doesn't provide you with a vision, so they give you something, especially if you're poor, to be attracted to, to, and, you know, this kind of militarism that they have, uh, and the violence that they use is about reclaiming power over their own destiny. Uh, you know, whether rightly or wrongly, again, that's a, de a debate we can have. But nonetheless, they become, they provide an alternative vision to how you actually can deal with these things. So, uh, finally, you know, I think what we end up seeing, and I've seen some questions here, and I will get back to some of them, including the one about the Shah. But I want to finish up fairly quickly before we get there. So while these regimes continue to exercise a very repressive environment, uh, they were living in many ways in regimes uh, that were a product of the 20th century. And what I mean by that is they really thought that they could always control the means of communication the means of education. The problem is globalization is happening in these regions at a very fast rate. By the 1980s, if you flew into Cairo, you would see that every tall building had literally almost like a forest of satellite dishes that we're now bringing in the world into the living room. Whether it is amazing stuff like Baywatch or whether it is an educational show out of Czechoslovakia or Italy. 
So globalization is beginning to happen in the sense that it's allowing, it's puncturing holes in this kind of walls, again, to use that metaphor of Pink Floyd, that are surrounding the population. And now uh, the state is no longer in control of this. Of course, by the time we get to the 21st century, the age of the internet and globalization, and of course with social media, uh, in many ways, a lot of these regimes have no control whatsoever. Uh, so instead of, you know, neoliberalism and these violent Islamist visionaries, and they're not all Islamists, of course, you have other kinds of visionaries as well. What you end up with is what I'm labeling Facebook generation. And I'm not saying Facebook itself creates them, but rather they learn how to use this tool. They are these people that are not driven by ideology, but they are driven by an attempt to solve a problem. For instance, the young woman on the left who's standing by herself, who's Egyptian, she was a, organized the first human rights film festival in Egypt. When the state, the day before, shut down the film festival, she immediately had, took the initiative and hired several riverboats because in, on the Nile, like on the Mississippi, uh, river law is different than land law, and she kept the film going. The young woman in the middle of the picture on the right she was one of the first people to organize the April 7th movement that ultimately leads to the Arab Spring. So although the Arab Spring, of course, did not lead in most places to the changes that people really wanted at the level of society and economy, the reality is uh, it, it allowed this generation to have a voice and to say enough. And in fact, enough becomes the code word for a lot of these revolutionaries. So again, if we're looking across the stretch of uh, the 20th century into the first beginning of the 21st century, what we end up with here is the fact that there's a new generation that's emerging that is seeking a better way of life. It may not appear at this point in the region that they've accomplished much, but in fact they have. They've created a very different vision to what has existed before, regardless of whether they have power or not. Now, let me conclude here very quickly because you know I'm over time a little bit. And I want to say in essence that uh, what I've tried to do here is to create a historical trajectory. And what you will notice is that religion is only part of the story, very much like religion in the United States is only part of the story of this country. The Middle East, uh, in general, you can tell the story of the region, not necessarily by referring to it as a timeless place, as a place that is hyper-religious, as a place that, uh, you know, in, in many ways, is somehow stuck somewhere around the time of Christ or the time of Muhammad, but rather it's a historical place. It's a place whose people and population are engaged with the same historical dynamics that we are engaged in, the quest for what we call the pursuit of happiness, for equality, and for change. And this is a quest that has crossed the 20th century, despite the fact that across that same time period, repressive regimes and external intervention has stymied and stifled and frustrated a lot of the hopes of the people of the population. And I'm going to stop there because I want to allow us to have a little bit of conversation. So I see some questions and I, I, I don't know if Mike is going to come back on this. Yes. Uh, line. Uh, but I, I, I want to talk to, uh, respond to some of the questions. So I'm going to go back to the beginning just to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And Mike, if you can flag anything for me, that would be great. Uh, but I noticed one thing. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions is, uh, wouldn't the limited spending on education have an impact on employment? It absolutely did. In fact, part of the problem with this, uh, the crisis in education is that it was producing, in many ways, semi-literate and in some cases illiterate kids uh, who were not really able to go on and deploy that education in any effective way. And that crisis wasn't only at the K through 12 level, it was also at the level of colleges and universities in various places. Now, of course, I must, has, my stop, <coughs> excuse me, must emphasize here <coughs> that this is not a universal situation. These are primarily uh, places like in Egypt, which didn't have a whole lot of money. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you will find that the universities are very well endowed there, but their approach to education is still very limited. It doesn't allow for what we understand to be liberal arts education. There are beacons of liberal arts education, such as the American University in Beirut, which has been established, established in 1860 and continues to be considered the Harvard of the Middle East, and the American University in Cairo to a certain extent. But these are few and far in between. The majority of people are going to universities that are either 
you know, basically, uh, you have about a thousand students per classroom, and the, the professor is getting paid two hundred dollars, and they rarely are in attendance. And sometimes they leave, go to the Gulf because they get paid more money. Um, and the diploma is really not worth its weight in, in paper. Or if you go to the Gulf, where the universities are very rich, uh, you will find that they curtail liberal arts education very much so because they're afraid of critical analysis and so on and so forth. Uh, now, the other thing that I think somebody was asking, the Shah, and this is Suzanne, I think, she said the Shah also brought much good to the people in terms of higher education, more opportunity for non-Muslim minority. There is no doubt that the Shah and what's called the White Revolution did bring about uh, some changes. But the problem is, again, these changes were imposed from above. The White Revolution was something that was developed in uh, collaboration with the University of Chicago and part of what's called modernization theory. And the idea is that uh, if you give people certain benefits, education, an apartment, a car, a radio, they will become less prone to become communist or socialist or politically active. In other words, the purpose of the Shah's White Revolution, which included higher access to education, wasn't to provide for a society that was truly free, but rather, as I was alluding to earlier with the term Rontia state, to in essence buy the allegiance of it. And that did not work very well. And I'll give you an illustration. I have a colleague who's now a professor at the University of Illinois, who was sent abroad to the University of California in Berkeley in the end of the 1960s, early 70s, on a grant, a scholarship from the Iranian government. But he got a PhD in sociology and he becomes radicalized and he becomes an anti-Shah activist because of that. So again, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that just because the Shah was throwing his population some crumbs, it doesn't mean that he was actually giving them the freedom that they all wanted. And more, more importantly, he may be giving them a small percentage, but a small elite of the Iranians were in essence taking a lot more percentage of the gross domestic product uh, to the point where the sister of the Shah could take a 707, which you know in 1970 was the best plane, and fly to London for a weekend to go shopping. And I think that's very important uh, to keep that in mind. Uh, let's see, Mike. Uh, da, 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 da. So uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, uh, and there's no doubt that of course countries are flawed, but the question isn't about, and this is something that William alluded to. Uh, I don't, you're absolutely right, William. I don't think we can look at any country in the world and consider it to be not flawed, but there are of course degrees of how flawed things are. So for the United States, there are deep flaws in this country, racial flaws, gender-based flaws, you know. Uh, so there are class-based flaws, of course, and we can point to them and, and talk about them. But the problem is, uh, at a place, if you go, for example, whether it's under the Soviet Union or whether it's in Egypt, uh, you know, under the Mubarak regime, those flaws are much more pronounced and in the sense that a larger percent of the population is being deprived of the opportunity to fulfill their potential, as I said. So we have to be very careful by saying everything is flawed. Well, of course, everything is flawed, you know, uh, but that there are real degrees of difference. Uh, to that. And again, I would like to sort of remind you <clears throat> that when we find flaws in democracies, we take, you know, uh, take these flaws to court. We vote against, we vote out the people causing the flaws, not always, sometimes. Uh, we write editorials and, you know, we demand change and so on and so forth. There's pressure. But in a place like Egypt, uh, if you raise your voice, <clears throat> and this is, by the way, the reason why we have the Arab Spring in 2010, a blogger who was critiquing the Mubarak regime, he gets beaten up by the security forces and they try to hide it that he did drugs and that's why he died, even though the autopsy showed that he was killed. So that's a different kind of flaw. And I think it's important uh, to keep that in mind at that point. Um, and uh, of course, again, the same thing with, in terms of leadership. Take somebody like Nasser who rules Egypt from 1952 all the way to 1970 when he dies. I mean, Nasser was a very popular leader. And if, you know, one could easily say that Nasser really wanted to make Egypt better. But the problem again is that uh, slowly but surely, uh, he begins to build an authoritarian state where anybody who opposes him, who disagrees with him, is a person who is a traitor to the country. He begins to equate himself with Egypt. He becomes Egypt in essence. And that's a problem because no single person can have solutions to any problem. So, yeah. 
you don't have a perfect leader, but there are leaders that are far better than others, as we can see in terms of the pandemic that we are experiencing. There are some leaders that have managed it very well, and there are others that have not managed it very well. And so uh, to, to sort of dismiss the notion that there's a problem just because no leader is flawed, uh, I mean, there's no leader that cannot be flawed, is really uh, too simplistic at this point. We have to really understand this uh, within the historical context in that regard. Uh, and Dr. Kater? Yes. Okay. Uh, also, you also had one early on from Suzanne, and uh, she asked, uh, "Can you talk about the roots of this of ethnic tribal religious tensions in the Middle East as a source of conflict or of continuing conflict?" I know we talked yeah. on shortly after, a little bit after World War One in 1916, but um, and then she followed with, uh, "How white? How might uh, we uh, mitigate this in the future, or what steps can be taken?" Uh, in the future to address it. I mean, that's what I was alluding to because I saw her question and I was trying to answer it on the fly, so to speak. Uh, and that's what I was saying that in many ways, sectarianism, whether it's tribal, ethnic, or religious, mm -hmm. uh, of course has a role in violence, but it's not, in, in many instances, it's not the main driver of violence. Rather, violence, whether it is by the state or from outside, is what creates sectarianism. It drives people towards sectarianism. I mean, again, it's it's really important to understand what violence does to societies it, it it just shreds what we consider to be normal behavior because it's it spreads fear and fear leads to a tribal mentality in which people circle the bandwagon so to speak because they're afraid to step outside uh, if you will so i think what is important to understand again is that the middle east is no different than any other place in the world in terms of ethnic tribal or religious divisions take the united states the United States was established in 1776, and to this day, we are still struggling with the notion of race. We have not dealt with it. We have not resolved it in any way, form, or shape. Sometimes people try to dismiss it, but the reality is race is a very strong divider uh, you know, in, in this country. But what happens with the race is that it's not consistent. What I mean by that is that we certainly are much better off than the 19th century when slavery was all over the place. You know, we cannot say that, you know, we're worse off than we're in the 19th century, but that doesn't mean that race is completely gone. And there are certain situations in which race in the United States is a very important topic of conversation and a driver of tension. And there are other moments when it recedes a bit. The same thing could be said about the region. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. The region is not unique. It's not different in any way, form or shape. Islam is no different than Judaism and, and Christianity. No matter how much observers would like it to be, it's not. It's a historical religion like Islam and like Christianity and Judaism. And the role it plays in day-to-day -day life will change dramatically. I'll give you another example. If you went to Baghdad in the 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s, you would find that there were mixed marriages between Sunni and Shia, especially amongst the middle class. Because by that time, what was relevant isn't your religion. What was relevant is your class, middle class, educated. What was attracting people to each other isn't their religion, it's their the circles that were going around. Then we have the invasion, and then all of a sudden, you know, we uh, visit a, a huge amount of violence upon the country, as well as internal players are doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, what we begin to see is militia violence uh, is creating this tension that slowly but surely people are afraid and they retreat. So again, they are not perennial. They are not things that don't change. They are subject to history, and we have to understand them within that context. All right, I think I saw... Da, 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 da. All right, so Andrea, Andrea... Okay, so I'll start with Kate, and I'm going to go back to Andrea. So okay. in the reading, I was talking about... It's not so much because Andrea is asking about uh, the reason, you know, we have the, the attack, if you will, or the anti-American sentiment isn't just about cultural influence. It's also about military interventions. Again, we can argue about whether it's justified or not. But the reality is when we intervene militarily, directly or indirectly, we are causing death and destruction. And again, some of us may say it's worth it. It's justified. We were driven to it, and that's an argument that could be had. But that's not the point here. The point is, when people are on the receiving end of cruise missiles or artillery shells or bullets, 
they are that are made in America and that are deployed by America, there is going to be resentment. There is going to be anger. There's going to be frustration. And I'll give you an example. When Iraq invaded Kuwait uh, in the in, uh, in early 1990s, we basically said, you have to get out of Kuwait or else we will bring the might of the American military to bear upon you, along with our coalition forces from across the world. Now, the problem is, uh, there was a diplomatic solution. Most people saw, thought there was a diplomatic solution. And again, it's a complicated story, but there was a diplomatic solution. Uh, and in essence, then, we chose at that point the military option. Again, rightly or wrongly, put it to the side. But what that did in essence is that's when Al Jazeera, the satellite uh, TV station that's based in Qatar, begins to broadcast from within Iraq as the bombs are falling on Baghdad and other cities. Those were not censored. Those were being beamed into the homes of Arabs throughout the Middle East and North Africa as they saw death and destruction being visited upon this country. Most, most Arabs hated Saddam Hussein and considered him to be a dictator. But when they saw the death and destruction at the hands of the United States, again, for us, it may have been justified. For them, it was not. And that only fed this resentment. So. The fact of the matter is we live in a global world. There's no way we can dissociate ourselves from the world. There's no way we can create a fortress America in which we build walls. Those days are long gone as we all can see from day to day life. The question is, how do we engage? How do we engage the world? But in this case, how do we engage, especially uh, the Middle East and North Africa? Do we engage it as a place that is completely, is only a source of oil and a source of violence? Or do we engage it as filled with people that are similar to us who are seeking uh you know to have a life that is normal or is it a combination of both again we don't have to be naive about this but at the same time we have to understand that we cannot continue to be engaged militarily and assume there's not going to be reaction on the part of the region uh so let me see here in a second so uh and then kate was asking about china and here i think what's important is that china of course is becoming a hub of power for the region because of a lot of its economic encounters within that area. And I think uh, in many ways, we have spent so much energy between at least 1982 and now on military interventions in the region that that's all we seem to be doing. That created a hole in which China has filled through economic activities because they didn't have to spend a single penny. They never sent an aircraft carrier, a plane, a soldier to the region. What they send are basically, you know, salespeople, engineers, and so on and so forth. And the hole that they filled in a hole that we have abandoned. It doesn't mean it's permanent, nor does it mean that everybody in the Middle East likes the Chinese or thinks the Chinese are doing this out of the goodness of their heart. But it does mean that for us to maintain a relationship with the region that is positive, we have to change our approach to the region. All right. Uh, which nation? Sorry, I'm trying to read backwards now. Uh, so I think the question that uh, I think William is asking about which which country in the region is making the greatest progress towards uh, free and stable democratic society, I would have to say Tunisia, which is in North Africa, obviously. Uh, the Arab Spring there was probably the most successful uh, experiment. Uh, and in many ways, I think one of the things that you can measure when we're looking at the Arab Spring, when scholars look at the Arab Spring and try to understand why it succeeded in some places and it didn't succeed in others, uh, at least one of the key factors, it's not the only one, but one of the key factors is NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Because NGOs are in many ways incubators of self-rule and democratic rule. Uh, not always, of course, you can have authoritarian NGOs, but a lot of times, especially when they're funded by the USAID, United States Agency for International Development, or the European Union Commission for International Development, uh, they have certain you know, conditions, including governance and bylaws and so on and so forth. So Tunisia had a very strong educated middle class, uh, and it also had a very a vibrant NGO, that when the government fell, the NGOs immediately stepped in and were able to continue and model governance. So that's why you see them there, as opposed to a place like Syria, which devolved into a, a civil war that was absolutely horrendous and violent, or Egypt, where the military recaptured power. So uh, I think Tunisia would be the best example at this point. Uh, but I think 
beyond nations, what you find is that there are pockets of uh, people trying to govern themselves in a democratic way. And those are fairly widespread in Morocco. Uh, you see them in Egypt, even in Lebanon, uh, of course, not in Syria, uh, Iraq to a much lesser extent. But even in Iran, you have, which has an authoritarian uh, theocracy in some ways, it also has a subculture of democracy that is really interesting. Uh, I think uh, somebody wanted me to talk about Yemen. I'm going to get to that in just a bit. But I think there was one question we're going to go back to. Uh, uh, da, da, da. Was it a question or was there a state? I'm, yeah, I saw a link was up as well. Okay, so Michael, and I think to a certain extent I address this, is do I see... Uh, a future in which the U.S. plays a productive role in the Middle East? Absolutely, I do. Look, I mean, the U.S. is not bad or good. Again, we need to go beyond binaries uh, because even as we were bombing, there are actually people within the State Department and other, you know, and, and non, non-governmental people, the Americans that are going there, exercising people's di diplomacy. And I think what's remarkable in the region is people differentiate between Americans and American government, even today. Uh, there's a great deal of... Uh, uh, there's a great deal of warmth and love for American people, not so much for American government for obvious reasons, but even you know at the level of state. I mean, I think there are a lot of pe there are a lot of programs that are positive, that do provide for training, for you know empowering women, for literacy campaigns. So I'm not saying that everything that we do is bad or everything that we do is good, but the balance should be shifted. And so, as you know, cruise missile costs you know several million dollars. You can imagine what several million dollars can do. In terms of education, you know, I mean, I think my passion is obviously education because I think it is the bulwark of democracy, uh, public education especially. I mean, when I first arrived in this country, I was absolutely blown away that you can go to school for free, or relatively speaking, so and get an excellent education at a public school and go on to some of the best universities. And to me, without public education, you cannot have democracy. That's what we have to be kind of funding, you know. That's what we have to be supporting in many ways. And I can see a role for teach American teachers, I can see a role for State Department and so on and so forth. Uh, some, Andrea wanted me to talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, look, it's an incredibly complicated, and amongst the 109 people who are you know, uh, on this uh, call here on webinar, I'm sure we have about 120 different opinions. Uh, it's, it's a complicated thing. Uh, and obviously, I am gonna come at it personally as an Arab. I'm not gonna pretend that I don't have you know, certain sympathies, you know, because of where I grew up, but also as a historian, forget my ethnicity, as a historian, I do see this as a very problematic situation in which one country, uh, Israel, is occupying another people, the Palestinians, and they've been doing this since 1967. And again, you can give me all sorts of justifications, but this is the only instance that we have this long a period in which one country is occupying the people, and not occupying them benignly, but suppressing them on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not good for Israel. That is not good for the Palestinians. Look, the reality is neither the Palestinians nor the Israel, Israelis are going anywhere. They're going to be there. They should be there. They both have a right to exist. The question ultimately is how. It cannot be sustained in which one group of people dominates another group of people and keeps taking away bit by bit more of their land and you know putting them, in essence, in the equivalent of apartheid, uh, Bantus towns or reservations. You can't. That is only going to generate a pressure cooking environment that will explode over and over again. And aside from that, it is inhumane and it's unethical. And it will warp the very essence of Zionism, which is to create a place where Jews can be free. And, and many Israeli scholars have commented on that. So to my mind, the only solution, and it's, you know, there are a lot of issues, of course, and a lot of questions, but we are way beyond the two-state solution. It's not going to happen. The only solution is going to be a one-state solution in which people exist as human beings. Uh, this old 19th century idea of the nation state belonging to one group of people is outdated. It doesn't work. The world is far too complex. Even the smallest of nations is too complex to assume there's a single ethnicity. Turkey is not filled with Turks. It has a lot of Kurds. Iraq is not just Arab. It has a lot of Kurds. Iran is not simply Persian. It has Arabs and Azaris. Israel is not Jewish. Israel has a very strong minority that is Arab. Those are realities that we cannot ignore any more than we would accept the United States that only gives citizenship to a particular shade of color. 
uh, we would reject that. And yet that seems to be acceptable in certain conditions. So the point I'm trying to make that is not healthy for anybody. It is not healthy for the purpose for the people dominating and it is not healthy for people being dominated. We have to move to a different kind of idea of nation state in which people are integrated, not because of their ethnicity or language, but because you know they want to belong and abide by the laws and live a peaceful and just life within that particular area. All right, uh, Yemen. I really can't say a whole lot about Yemen because I'm really not an expert on Yemen by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but if you're talking about the current situation, Yemen is the latest, I would say Syria is as well, uh, stage in which Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Saudi allies, the United Arab Emirates primarily, are basically conducting a cold and hot war. It's the stage for their conflict. Iran and Saudi Arabia are competing with each other, both with very uh, retrograde visions of the region, competing with each other over who is going to dominate the area. And Yemen, which has a Shia community, uh, is in the heart of that conflict. Uh, the Saudis have militarized that conflict, so did the Iranians. And the, the human toll is just beyond belief, not only in terms of you know, people dying from bombardment and violence internal, but also the outbreak of cholera, of all things in the world. Uh, Yemen was always a poor country, and this has driven it even further down. Uh, the infrastructure was already problematic before all of this, and now it's even worse. And uh, the Saudis bear a great deal of responsibility for this. So do the Iranians. Okay, Dr. Kata, I just want to let you know we have about another 14, 15 minutes left. And uh, I see Michael and Anne both have questions in the chat box, so we can continue on. And again, thank you for responding to these questions. Sure. Uh, so Michael was asking about what's the best way to criticize Israel without being perceived as biased or anti-Semitic. Uh, look, I mean, I think this has become a problem in the United States that we cannot have a rational conversation about Israel without immediately somebody jumping up and down saying that, uh, you know, you're being uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, it's not to say anti-Semitism is not real. It's very real. It's ugly. It's violent. It's dangerous. But it's primarily exercised by people who are white nationalists, uh, who every now and then may, you know, spout a few uh, anti-Israel things, but really they are anti-Jews. Uh, for those who want to engage in a conversation, I think the way to do it is to say, look, I really want what's best for Israel, but I also want what's best for Palestinians. The question isn't should Israel exist or not exist? The question isn't whether you know Palestinians should exist or not exist. The question is, how do we approach this in a way that allows both people to coexist, both people to thrive, and both people to have dignity and control over their destiny? And I think that has nothing to do with whether one is you know, pro or anti an ethnic community. Uh, second, I think one can criticize an action without criticizing a people. What I mean by that, if, for example, the Palestinians or if, for example, a group of Palestinians carry out a terrorist attack against an uh, Israeli town, one has every right to say that is unacceptable, that is terrorism. But one should not say all Palestinians are terrorists. The same thing with Israel. If Israel carries out a repressive politics, for example, in Israel, there are laws on the books that prohibit Jews from renting to Arabs. That is apartheid. That is racism. That policy is. But you are attacking the policy and not saying that all Israelis are racist. You're just simply saying that is unacceptable. That's not a law that's acceptable. I wouldn't accept that law in the United States. We used to have them, but we don't have them anymore. So I think in many ways, that's how we begin to deal with it. The problem is that in the United States, uniquely in the United States, we can't even talk about this anymore. If you go to Europe and you go to other places, you can actually have a conversation about this matter. Here, there's a whole industry that is driven to just completely shut down any conversation about this. And I think it's a misguided approach. It's not good for Israel. It's never going to be good for Israel for us not to be able to have a forthright, frank conversation about the topic. Uh, so Anne was asking about Oman. Oman is uh, a police state in many ways, but it's a very, you know, generally speaking, peaceful police state. Uh, it's like most of what's called the tertiary states. These are the Arab states along the Persian Gulf. Uh, it was established under British tutelage around, you know, uh, the turn of the 20th century. And it's ruled uh, in a monarchy. 
you know, there's a monarchy that rules it. There's a king that rules it. It has oil, although uh, most of the oil right now is not, I mean, obviously now oil is so cheap, but even before that, it really wasn't the main source of their income as much anymore. Uh, a small percentage of the pop, well, actually that's true, a fairly uh, decent percentage of the population is originally from Africa. They were brought in as slaves from East Africa, Tanzania to be exact. Uh, and uh, they're part of the population. And Omani government doesn't like to talk about that history very much, obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, in terms of slavery. Uh, the regime until the 1970s was incredibly uh, retrograde and authoritarian. Uh, but then the son, in essence, staged a coup, took over, and he just passed away, by the way. So Pell Qaboos just passed away. Um, and established a more modern, but still a very repressive state uh, in Oman. And much of the workforce is South Asian, very much like the rest of uh, the Gulf. Uh, so a lot of the managerial class is from India, and a lot of the working classes come from Sri Lanka and other places in South Asia. Uh, again, we don't see much about it in the news uh, because you know uh, they really keep a very low profile. Uh, the most important thing that they put in the United States is the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., and they have a very strong lobby effort in the United States to only to basically keep themselves out of the news. That's why you don't see much about it. Uh, and Pamela. Uh, was asking if there's a pan-Arab or pan-Middle East movement amongst youth that parallels the pan-African youth movement. Absolutely. If you look at the Arab Spring, it was in many ways a pan-Middle East, pan-North African movement. Uh, but before that, I mean, I think this is what I find to be very hopeful. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a fantastic uh, heavy metal band. It's an Israeli heavy metal band. And the, the musicians and singers are primarily what we call uh, Sephardic Jews. These are Jews that come from the Arab, Arabic speaking countries. And these kids are primarily from Morocco. Uh, and uh, they, you know, like most heavy metal bands, they write lyrics and uh, music that is very uh, rejectionist of the kind of the bourgeois lifestyle that Israel is in. Uh, and they're incredibly popular amongst Arab youth. In fact, many Saudi and Gulf Arab youth go to Turkey to Istanbul to listen to their concerts. Um, and you see a lot of Israelis from Arab background who listen to Arab musicians uh, sing in Arabic because to them, Arabic remains uh, a vital part of who they are. I mean, it's part of what they grew up with. Uh, there is a lot of circulation that's happening in the Middle East. That's what I was referring to when I said the nation state model with borders is no longer really a feasible model. People are circulating. If you go to Dubai, if you go to Egypt, if you go to Lebanon, there's a great deal of circulation in and out. And with that circulation comes a lot of new ideas, a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas. In the Arab Spring, to go back to that again, uh, although the Arab Spring started in Tunisia, it spread quickly to the rest of the Arab world and it spread quickly through the mechanism of social media and through youth networks. These are youth that have you know, uh, been to, for example, training workshop together in Beirut to look at how you organize NGOs or protests, or they have, had a reading uh, group that read over the internet uh, Martin Luther King's biography, one of the most popular uh, comic books in the region in the early, early 2000s was a comic, uh, comic novel, I mean, uh, graphic novel about the life of Martin Luther King. So yes, in answer to your question, uh, that is absolutely the case. Oh, the heavy metal band is, is called The Cursed Land, which is a play on Promised Land. Uh, let's see, Michael was saying if the U.S. places, and this is probably the last question we'll have time for, if the U.S. places its support for Israel, Saudi Arabia, above human rights, is it even possible for the U.S. to be a part? I think so. Look, I mean, the U.S., like every other country, is not a monolith. Uh, we are made of all sorts of things. We are made of an administration that changes its policies, generally speaking, every four or eight years. We are made of State Department officials who are career officials who within limits can actually attenuate some of that policy. We are made of artists, we are made of teachers, we are made of travelers. Uh, so the influences that we have is no longer has to be state to state. I think that idea of politics, although it's still very powerful, especially since states have the monopoly on violence, uh, nonetheless, they don't have a monopoly on diplomacy. 
And what I mean by diplomacy is human encounters and trying to come to understand each other and then build policies based on that understanding. That can be built in all sorts of ways. You know, uh, for example, there's a group in Colorado that used to anyway annually bring teenagers from Israel and from among the Palestinian occupied territories to Colorado mountains, which are glorious and I think they are God's gift to the world, to you know to do outdoor activities and to live. It doesn't mean they'll solve the problem of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but at least they create these small tender shoots of a communication that you know hopefully will grow with time. So there are ways in which the United States can do these kind of things. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike, I think we're almost out of time. Is that correct? Yeah, we are. We we are. We have about five more minutes. Um, if you okay, uh, so to... I think Jacqueline had one question. And uh, sorry, uh, Britain, you're absolutely right. It is the Orphan Land. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> one of their songs is called Curse Land, and I mixed the song with their title. Yeah. Uh, so, and I'll answer this question very quickly. To what this is from Jacqueline. To what extent do I believe that the invasion of Iraq was related to oil reserve? There's no doubt that it had something to do with it, uh, but it really isn't about primarily about that. I think that was a subset. It's not really about weapons of mass destruction either. What it was about is a group of neoconservatives that came to power under the Bush younger administration, who were very dedicated to the idea of reshaping the Middle East. They wanted to rework the Middle East dramatically to the benefits of Israel and the United States. And the way they imagined it is a domino effect in which they would go into Iraq, topple Saddam Hussein, establish a democracy, uh, and that would apply pressure on Iran where an internal revolution would happen and a democratic system would emerge, and next would be Syria, and lo and behold, the Middle East would be transformed into a pro-American environment. That is the hubris of empire. That is the hubris of people who think just because they want it, it's going to happen. And that's the hubris of people who had no consideration for what people on the ground wanted. In many ways, it was a replay of the French and the British of the early 20th century, which is in many why it failed so miserably. Uh, it failed very much because uh, and you, what we left in, in, in uh, Iraq and in the region are failed states and a lot more violence. We did not solve any problem at all with Iraq. The oil was a secondary aspect of it, I would say. Again, thank you all for taking parts of this and thank you for being teachers. Uh, you are transforming lives and you're doing it brilliantly, I'm sure. Again, I wish we had time to see each other and talk to each other in person, but this will have to suffice. I wish you all the best, stay healthy and stay safe. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and being here for us. I wanted to also actually give a shout out to Emma Harbour, who is also on the, uh, who is also participating tonight. And I am scrolling up in an attempt to uh, locate the message that she posted, but I believe there are thank yous that are coming in and I keep having to reset and go back up to the top. So if I can take a moment to go ahead and get that announcement in, I guess it'd be very helpful. Um, but uh, while I'm scrolling to that, I wanna let everyone know again, thank you for participating and for spending your evening with us. Uh, when I close the room tonight, you'll be prompted to complete a survey. And once you take that survey uh, and evaluation, you will receive a certificate of completion to document the continuing education work uh, that you participated in this evening. It generally takes one hour for that, uh, evaluation to become live. Uh, if you experience any difficulties or anything with that, please feel free to uh, to shoot me an email. My email is mwilliams at nationalhumanitycenter.org. Um, but I'd also encourage you all to keep up with what's happening at the National Humanities Center through our various social media uh, feeds to get updates on our activities. You can also join our email list by going to our webinar registration page or go into the URL that is listed on the screen and you'll get a constant contact email on occasion that shares with you new deadlines and new activities that we have planned. Again, um, before I exit, I do want to go ahead and uh, go ahead and read out that announcement that we have and I believe it was in here somewhere if I'm able to. And again, everyone, thank you all for participating. Emma, if you'd like to go ahead and put that announcement back in, that may help me because I'm scrolling through thank yous right now. Um, but again, everyone, uh, we truly appreciate it. Um, okay, here we are. And uh,
Catherine reposted, but the Duke USC Consortium uh, for Middle East Studies is beginning a virtual exchange program for the University of Arizona between teachers in the U.S. and teachers in the MENA region. The application deadline is April 30th, and the program will take place in the 2021 school year. And so if you are interested, there is a link that is in the box. Again, shout out to Catherine. Thank you for reposting that. And for information application, you can email harbor at email.unc.edu. Again, thank you all and uh, continue to be safe. And we hope you all uh, continue to do well. And uh, thank you all for being teachers and just uh, all the great things that you are doing. Um, on behalf of the National Humanities Center, my name is Mike Williams, and we will be launching the survey here shortly. Take care and have a good night.